Are you looking for the best in-depth training for your cyber defense team? Look no further than SANS Blue Team courses. Whether you focus on network or host data, Windows, Linux, or even specialize in open source intelligence, SIEM, SOC, or defensive architecture, the SANS Blue Team curriculum has the course for you. From longtime classics like SEC 503, Network Intrusion Detection, to the newer SEC 530, Defensible Security Architecture and Engineering, and SEC 487, Open Source Intelligence Gathering, no matter what your specialty, we've got you covered. With an extensive archive of free webcasts on the SANS site and free online demos available for most courses, you can easily check out the SANS Blue Team catalog and see which course is the best fit for you and your team. Check out the constantly growing list of available courses at sansurl.com slash blueteamops. This is the Blueprint Podcast, bringing you the latest in cyber defense and security operations from top Blue Team leaders. Blueprint is brought to you by the SANS Institute and is hosted by SANS Certified Instructor John Hubbard. And now, here's your host, John Hubbard. You've seen it plenty of times. Data breaches from open S3 buckets, cloud accounts taken over due to over-permissioned users. Are we doomed to have these problems forever? Is this an impossible problem to solve? Today on the podcast, we tackle that issue with AJ Yan. And a hint, the answer is no. It's not an impossible problem. We can deal with this. Today on the podcast, we talk solutions. We talk about compliance, why it's no fun, why it's hard, and what we can do to start to correct it. We talk about cloud solutions for these problems, the common troubles that lead to breaches and how to prevent and detect those problems, and some of the specific tools you can use to prevent employees from making common mistakes and even automate the fixes. All that and more today on the Blueprint Podcast. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Blueprint Podcast. Today on the show, we have AJ Yon, co-founder and CEO at ByteCheck. Welcome to the podcast, AJ. Thanks, John. Happy to be here. I appreciate being on. It's uh, always cool to do stuff with SAN, so, so appreciate the opportunity to chat with you today. Absolutely. Thank you. First, can we get a little bio and uh, information on your background and what kind of your specialties are? Yeah, absolutely. So um, I'm AJ Yan. I uh, have been in the cybersecurity industry for about a decade. Uh, currently, the co-founder and CEO at ByteCheck which is a cybersecurity uh, SaaS company that's focused in the compliance space. Uh, I started my career in the U.S. Army, like a lot of information security professionals, our, our military background, did some consulting after that, and really carved out a space in cloud security, uh, specifically around AWS. So been a fun journey. Definitely, if you told me 10 years ago when I was a second lieutenant that I'd be uh, running a cybersecurity software company, I would have thought you were pretty crazy. So the message there is that the opportunities are endless in cybersecurity, which is what I just keep seeing on a daily, day-to-day basis. You picked a good spot too. cloud security, obviously one of the hottest things out there. So you couldn't have uh, landed in a better spot for sure. Why I brought you on the podcast is I saw your uh, presentation from about a month ago called Automating Security in AWS. And obviously, this is something that's going to apply to nearly every single organization right now. So with that, along with your your expertise in kind of compliance and auditing, I thought it would be an interesting conversation to have kind of starting out with some of the compliance things that we have to consider you know, for every organization and then how that's meshing with cloud and cloud security and some of the mistakes people are making and how we can hopefully get ahead of those things so that they never happen in the first place and, and kind of correct those errors. So to start off, easy question, right? Compliance. Um, where does it fit into like the day-to-day concerns for the average security operations team? Yeah, you know, it it should fit in a large aspect, uh, but oftentimes, you know, uh, the actual security professionals, the people that are in the day-to-day grind are abstracted from the compliance process until their compliance manager, internal auditor shows up and says, I need screenshots. And then, you know, you're like, screenshots of what? They're like, I don't know. I just need screenshots of the things you do. And then they don't know what they're asking for. You don't know what they're asking for. But if you think about what they're actually asking for from a SOC perspective, there's so many controls in the compliance space that apply to what a, a SOC analyst does on a regular basis. Just the act of logging, just the act of using some kind of system incident and event management tool is a critical control in every cybersecurity compliance framework. But that's just one control. <laughs> that's just, just one aspect. You have to, what do you do with that information? What is that SOC analyst doing as he sees an alert, he or she sees an alert come in? What's the next steps? How do they communicate that out to other teams? How are the tickets done? What's the time between I found something bad and I remediate it? All of those things are going to come up in your compliance assessment. So I think 
the thing that anybody in the security industry should know uh, about compliance is that your day to day activities 100 percent impact the compliance assessment, even onboarding and offboarding. Uh, when you join an organization and you do security awareness training, you do acknowledgments of policies, confidentiality agreements. That's all a part of compliance and your organization is getting evaluated of it. Uh, about it. And the other thing that I'll, I'll mention about compliance that's a little different than other aspects of security is that the reason why your company is doing a compliance assessment isn't because they want to. <laughs> they're, they're not, it's not a voluntary activity. They're doing it because they, they can get some business out of it. They can secure some deals. They can close sales. They can actually um, move up into bigger markets. So it's really important exercise that I think we need to get more of the security side, more of those SOC analysts involved because they'll understand the impacts of their day-to-day decisions. Yeah. So you mentioned, you know, it's not something organizations typically want to do. And it's one of those activities that, you know, if you are getting pulled into an audit and, you know, compliance assessment, people are usually like, eh. <laughs> in your experience, what is the reason for that kind of like ah, another one of these, right? Is it that they aren't effective? Is it because they're painful? Is it all the above? I think it's all of the above, but I think if you peel that back and understand the the reasons to me are that the auditors are not technical enough. Uh, The auditors don't know what they're asking and they don't know what they're looking at. And the security professionals know that. So they have two choices here. They can show them the real information and go into extreme detail about what's going on, but then that's going to confuse their auditor and get more questions. So the process becomes even less effective and more time consuming. Or they can just grab a screenshot and put the wool over their eyes and say, hey, everything's good and move on. But when that happens, it turns into a check the box exercise. It's just like, hey, I'm I'm the security pro. I have way better things to do than spend time with an auditor. So I'm just going to give him what he needs, he or she needs, and I'm going to get out the way and go about my day because it doesn't matter to them. And I think what we need to shift in this space is that compliance is looked at as a way to improve your security to actually add some some better security features and controls in your environment. And it's looked at as a way to actually see if there's any weaknesses and not just to check the box exercise. Because then when I have these conversations in, in the audit space and I'm talking to these CTOs and we're diving deep into stuff on AWS and we're talking about all these things, they're like, okay, like that's good information that I can actually utilize. After they realize that like I'm actually trying to help them and give them better information, they start telling me everything. I start hearing all about all the skeletons in the closet and all these things that they wouldn't have shared if they didn't understand that I knew what they were talking about. So I think the reason is just the lack of technical capacity from the audit side. And the security professionals are like, it's not worth it for me to to, to waste my time trying to explain all this stuff. I'm just going to give them what they need and get out of here. Sounds like it's a multifaceted problem. How do we go about fixing the maybe lack of technical capabilities for the average auditor? And I don't know if that's a fair characterization or not, but I mean, let's assume that's that's a core issue that is kind of repeated across multiple organizations. I know I've seen it, right? Certainly, we've all probably experienced at least one one kind of situation like that. Uh, how do we attack that angle of the problem? Yeah, I think uh, there's two things. One uh, is technology. Uh, you can't, I don't, I consider myself, you know, I think I know a little bit about AWS. I can't do a full manual audit in the cloud and catch everything. It's impossible. Things move too fast. Uh, there's too many resources out there. Things change. So you have to use tooling and auditors need to embrace technology. Uh, that's the other part. Auditors don't trust technology. So they're, they're constantly fighting back against technology because they want to do the traditional way with the screenshots, et cetera. So I think you have to bring technology in to help automate a lot of the hard parts, the technical parts of the assessment so that the auditors can go back to just having a conversation. There's two other things that I think should happen just from a conversation and philosophical perspective. Auditors need to stop running away from being technical. I used to hear this term all the time. Oh, you're a technical auditor. And I'm like, well, what's the alternative? (laughs) If If I'm evaluating a technical environment, what else should I be? Um, I should only be a technical auditor. So auditors have to embrace technology, have to go out and try to seek it. And I'm not saying they need to go learn Python. Um, no, but understand what the shared responsibility model is. Understand what RDS is and, and where the gap is there as far as what the organization has to do versus what the cloud provider does. Um, and then second is the organizations, when they undergo their audits, when they're talking to their auditors, they're constantly asking questions about how long is this going to take? How much is this going to cost me? They never ask about the technical capacity of the auditor, but you wouldn't go to a a heart doctor for a foot problem. So don't go to a non-cloud auditor if you have a cloud environment. If you're hosted on Azure, don't go to an auditor that knows AWS. Go to an auditor that knows Azure and make sure that they actually understand your environment because that's so important. And I think that's often overlooked 
mainly because of who's leading that process, right? It's usually somebody in the executive levels or somebody in the compliance space that's saying, I just need to find an auditor. But you should really get the developers, get the SOC analysts, get all those people that are touching the technologies involved when you're picking your auditor so that they actually have some buy-in in the process and want to um, participate because they trust the auditor. They trust their knowledge. Is this something like where maybe in the future we would have to have, you know, specializations in auditing and, and people would say, like, I am an AWS auditor, I am a GCP auditor and just assume and, and acknowledge that you can't be an expert enough in everything to deliver a solid audit? I would love that. I would absolutely love to like people to have these like badges of I'm the AWS audit guy or a girl, I'm the GCP, because that's what you need. You need someone because like it's just the same way. Like if you're not in the audit space, if you're a developer, if you're a cloud infrastructure architect or something, it's very hard to be a cloud architect that knows everything about Azure and everything about AWS. Like it's I don't know a lot of people that are I know a few people that are like super ridiculously smart dudes that like know all the different cloud providers and everything about them. But it's so hard for most normal humans to have that type of ability to know everything about every cloud provider. So I think that would be a really cool thing to see is like an auditor stepping up and saying, you know what, we are specialized in AWS. If you're hosted on AWS, come to us. If you're hosted on Azure, you probably want to find someone else uh, because I can't provide that same advice. Is there a way that if you're looking for an audit, right, like what questions might you ask that team to assess? Do their auditors really know like what they're talking about? Is there any kind of, you know, yardstick of sorts that you can have them prove that? I would ask about the team. What are their qualifications? But don't ask the person you're talking to. The person you're talking to probably going to have a bunch of uh, qualifications. Um, I used to do, you know, business development and sales in my role as a consultant. And I used to, you know, work with our clients. But as you move up in Anybody in security, if you hate sales, you don't want to get promoted then uh, because no matter where you go as you get into the higher levels, you're going to have to sell. Um, that's just a side note. But um, I would be on those calls and talking about all the AWS expertise we had, all the certs and all the, all the certs that I had. And then the project would start and I'd be somewhere else. I wouldn't be nowhere near the project. Um, so you want to make sure that the people that are actually going to work your project have the qualifications that you're being sold on. The other thing is I would ask, how did their knowledge of the cloud? So if they're saying, oh, we're AWS experts, how does that knowledge translate to the audit? How do you help me save my time? How do you make me more efficient? How do you make me more secure? What reports do you use on AWS to make this process easier? Are you leveraging, if you know a technology, if you're, if you're using Security Hub, ask them how Security Hub is going to play in the assessment. Um, how are they going to leverage Security Hub and what Security Hub's doing? And if you don't get the answers that you know you should, it's probably a sign you should move away because... When we think about cost and efficiency, those things will be impacted by the person's knowledge and expertise. If they know more about AWS, you probably will have lower costs and you'll be a lot more efficient. If they don't, they're going to ask you to get screenshots of your EC2 console to show security groups. And there's so many other better ways to prove that your security groups are good. So I think it's dive into the details, you know, the same way. The thing that's always funny to me is if you look up a compliance manager job description. It's going to say experience in, in whatever technology that you have. It's going to list out those technologies. But then you go and hire a third-party auditor and pay them 50, 60 grand, and you don't talk at all about technology. But you'll do it for your internal employee who's going to be running your compliance program. So it, my, my whole point in all of this is like when you're talking to your auditors, ask them a lot of questions about technology. Ask them how their experience, how their tools how their processes leverage the technology you're using to make the process easier and better for you, um, because that's where you're going to see the value. We'll be back after a quick break. If you're enjoying this episode, then you're undoubtedly interested in building the strongest security operations team that you can. For those who want to go even deeper, did you know that SANS has not one, but two courses that cover security operations centers as well? For the leaders, managers, and directors out there, my co-author Mark Orlando and I offer 551, Building and Leading Security Operations Centers. This course covers building your team, your physical and virtual workspace, getting the right data into your tools, and then focusing on security priorities through everyday execution of important security tasks and building the best SOC team possible. For the technical practitioners out there, my course SEC 450, Blue Team Fundamentals, Security Operations and Analysis, is designed to cover everything you need to jump in being the best SOC analyst that you can be. We cover important data types, SOC tools, security logs, malware, analysis technique, automation, and much, much more. 
In addition, if you want to prove you can deliver the best on any security team, both courses have an accompanying certification available from GIAC. That's the GSOM for 551 and the GSOC for 450. Check out both courses and free demos available on the SANS website. You can get registered today for an in-person course at one of our many events, or go to On Demand and take either class anywhere at your own pace. Thanks for listening. You mentioned a few things along the way here, and you may have already partially answered this question, but what about after the fact, right? You didn't do those things beforehand, and now you're sitting there with a with an assessment and you're looking at it. Have you seen bad... I know pen testers say this all the time, right? They're like, oh, that's a bad pen test, right? Like, I'm sure you've seen bad audits. What are the, the key things that you would look at and say like, oh, this is questionable? Yeah, so the in a SOC 2 report, which is... Uh, it, it's funny because SOC 2 is becoming like the de facto standard for cybersecurity compliance in the US. You actually get to see all the controls that were tested and, and the test steps and everything. The worst thing that you can possibly see is someone that's hosted on AWS, they get a SOC 2 report, you flip through, you're looking for controls, and you don't see any controls related to S3 buckets, literally none. And you're like, okay, so this is a security assessment. You paid $40,000 for this. You wasted three months of your time, and your auditor didn't check S3 buckets. And like, I can do a Google search and see how bad it is to have a public S3 bucket and what goes on when that happens. And this security assessment didn't actually look at that. And it's so like you can literally when I tell people all the time is like pick up a SOC 2 if they're hosted on AWS. If you don't see any mentioning of AWS in those controls, I probably wouldn't trust it um, because they probably didn't do a lot of the thing. They did a traditional report. They went through and tested this. I, I've seen AWS SOC 2 reports, not like AWS, but people hosted on AWS SOC 2 reports. And they had a control saying that they had firewalls in place. And I'm like, I know you did not have a firewall in place in AWS. You, you, you might be using security groups, and that's different, but you don't have an actual firewall appliance. And I mean, I guess you could, but it wouldn't make any sense. But it's just like little things like that that you can see, and you're like, well, I know that this report didn't go deep enough. I know you didn't actually look at their cloud environment. You just said, here's the controls that the AICPA gave me in this assessment, and this is what I'm going to do no matter what is going on in your environment. You're going to get those same set of controls. So it's very easy to see that in those assessments for sure it's it's, it's easy to, it's in SOC 2 it's it's a lot harder in some other ones because all you get is a cert you don't actually get the details like ISO just gives you a, certifi- a certificate so it's very hard to know how are things tested what happened in there and all that good stuff yeah so there's a lot of things in there I want to touch on in a second you know traditional mindset being applied to the cloud and all sorts of things like that but real quick before we get into the, the more cloud-centric discussion a SOC 2 audit for those who may have not gone through one or seen one or even know what that is. Can you just uh, talk for a brief moment about kind of how that fits into, you know, the the average security organization and what's that going to give them? Yeah. So a SOC 2 is um, an assessment that most companies, if you do business with another business, you're going to get asked about it during the sales process. They're going to say, hey, like, hey, John, your product is amazing. I want to do business with you. I'm this big, I'm Microsoft and I want to install your new security appliance in my environment. But before I do that, I need to make sure that your product is secure. So can you give me a report or you can answer this 1300 question security questionnaire and, and, and tell me all these things. So what happened is SOC 2 was created so that organizations don't have to answer 25, 1300 question questionnaires for every time they're trying to grow their business. The SOC 2 report is a, a report where a third party auditor comes in and says, I'm going to test you against these different categories and we're going to go through and test access control, risk assessments, vulnerability scanning, all this other stuff from a compliance perspective, give you a report that you can give out to multiple customers. So you can answer multiple customers' questions with one report. So it's really a sales function, um, but it could be used. The cool thing about SOC 2, different than other frameworks that people have probably heard of like PCI or FedRAMP or HIPAA or HITRUST, SOC 2 is not prescriptive. So in a SOC 2 report, it doesn't say you have to install AV. It says, how do you protect from malicious software? So the cool part about having an auditor that actually understands technology is if I know you're a completely 100% Linux shop, you're hosted in the cloud, I'm not going to ask you if you have Windows Defender installed. It doesn't make any sense. I'm going to ask you, what are some of the things you're doing to prevent malicious software from being introduced? What's your defense in depth strategy? Do you have a WAF? Do you, are you using an IDS? What kind of MFA do you have at different choke points? Um, how are you protecting when someone SSHs to your machines? I'm going to ask you about all of those things because 
antivirus doesn't really matter in your environment, right? And that's the cool thing about SOC 2, um, where you can have those reports that are really custom outlining some cool security things you're doing because there's no requirement of a standard set of controls in SOC 2. It's completely up to you and your auditor. And the other cool thing about that is SOC 2 is not going to tell you you have to do anything. So you can be like, yeah, I'm, I'm not doing that because it doesn't make sense in my environment, but here's what I'm doing. And when you have a good auditor, you can have those conversations. You can have the conversations about the unique things you're doing and then hopefully take advantage of it. So whenever anybody hears SOC 2, just think, you know, security assessment, covering the basic stuff that you would normally think of, access control, risk, vulnerabilities. But it's really used to help drive business and grow the business. One of the things I was thinking about kind of relating to our previous questions when you said that is, you know, when you ask a, a question like, what is your strategy for defense in depth, right? That's a very different question than do you have Microsoft antivirus installed? Like as someone who's not technical can be like, yep, they got it, check. And they don't have to be very technical. But does a SOC 2 audit done properly require a much more technical person? I think so. I, I absolutely think so. I think because of the flexibility of the framework, uh, because of uh, the way that you can take advantage of it, if you have a technical auditor or somebody that's going, assessor that you're going through this, they're going to be able to help you leverage the, the, the framework to actually have a powerful report. Um, they're going to be able to say like, oh, wow, you're doing, you're using uh, privilege identity management on, uh, on, AWS, on, on Azure that a lot requires users to check out machines, access to virtual machines and only have limited, you know, just in time access. Okay, we're going to have a control for that. But if you explain that to somebody that has literally no idea what I just said, they're going to say, uh, OK, cool. Well, where's your privileged users? Just give me the list of users so I can get out of here. So I think that's where, again, like if I'm an organization going through and getting a SOC 2, ask your auditor, how do you take advantage of this unique framework that's not prescriptive? How, what are some of the ways that you create custom controls? Do you have any examples of custom controls? If they host, if they're evaluating people on AWS they should have a control for Security Hub. They should have a control for Guard Duty. They should have a control for Inspector. All these different services that you may be using to automate things, your auditor should know about already and be able to talk, tell you how to take advantage of it in your, in your report. On the same token, I'm thinking, you know, with this more in-depth investigation, one of the kind of joking but maybe partially true phrases I've heard about compliance is compliance is one step above negligence, right? And it's kind of like, oh, you can be compliant, but you're not necessarily secure or just barely, right? Is the SOC 2 something that you actually would maybe trust more because it's a more thorough and less prescriptive investigation of what's going on? I would if I knew, if I know how they're being tested. Uh, so, uh, you know, if I know technology is involved, if I know you're using a tool that connects directly to AWS and I can see controls in there that say you are encrypting data stores at rest, I know that this tool saw all of your data stores. Because oftentimes, if you're an auditor, uh, a lot of auditors that I've known in the past, I'm saying, hey, how do you test data store encryption? They're like, oh, I just go look at the RDS instances in AWS. I'm like, okay, cool. So what about S3? <laughs> They're like, oh, wow. I'm like, oh, what about EBS volumes? They're like, oh, wow. Like there's way more data stores than just an RDS instance, right? If I see that control in a report and I don't see technology, I don't trust that you went out and looked at the EBS volumes or the S3 buckets, or maybe they're in DynamoDB or using Elastic Cache or something, right? I don't trust that you checked all of those things. So I would say if you see that, you got to really understand how are these things tested? Um, was there technology involved? Was there any automation involved? Because a lot of times, like you said, it's one step over negligence. It's smoke and mirrors in, this, in the compliance space. I'm trying to change that. Oftentimes, I talk to customers and they're like, well, what if I don't want security value? What if I just want a compliance check the box exercise? And I'm <laughs> like, well, you know, that's not how this works. But uh, you, I, I guess you can, you know, not want security. I don't, I don't know how to answer that question. But, you know, it's it's a definitely a philosophical change. I think it's similar to what we've seen with like DevSecOps, where like it takes mentality to change to get security involved. And I think for compliance, it's going to take a mentality to change to get security more the focus of those assessments. Yeah. So shifting to toward the cloud kind of technology and workflow and, and the stuff that we have to do now as we get in that direction as it regards to compliance. What are some of the complicating factors that, you know, make things even more difficult now that we're dealing with someone else's computer and, you know, all these new technologies and different cloud platforms and everything? Uh, what are you seeing companies struggle with in, in terms of checking and ensuring compliance when it comes to cloud computing? I think it's just visibility. Uh, you know, it, that's like a uh, it's like a double edged sword because in the cloud you have great visibility. You can see a lot, but also there's so much going on that you can miss a lot. And especially because of how easy it is to do things in the cloud. If you're operating in the command line, you could, in, in three lines, you can spin up an EC2 instance, spin up a database, and spin up an S3 bucket, all misconfigured. 
very quickly. <laughs> it doesn't take much to do that, right? Um, so it's how rapid things move. It makes it very difficult. And then also how I think a lot of organizations default to just uh, admin access. Everybody gets admin. Um, the, the permissions are so widely thrown around in the cloud because it's so e- it's it's a lot easier just to put a wild card in your uh, IAM policy than it is to uh, say specific services that someone should 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 have access to. So I think the biggest challenges I see are visibility, and then a lot of organizations make decisions when they move to the cloud that don't actually take advantage of the cloud. So they'll be running on prem. MySQL database, and they'll just take that and go put it on an EC2 instance in the cloud. And I'm like, well, you know, there's RDS. You could probably run that on an RDS instance and have him have have a little bit of a managed database service from AWS, or maybe you could put it in Aurora serverless and not even have to have any underlying infrastructure, right? And I think that's oftentimes a mistake because you're not taking advantage of some of the power of the cloud because you're just running basically an on-prem workload in the cloud the same exact way. Uh, so I think you know visibility. That unfiltered access that I often see, I often go in, I'm like, all right, you have all these users. Let's see what policies are associated with the user. And it's like admin, 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 admin. I'm like, are all these dudes admin? Like, like everybody can't be an admin. Um, somebody has to have a little bit lower permissions. And then, yeah, those are, those are some of the biggest challenges I see from a compliance perspective. So you kind of mentioned three big things there, right? Visibility, kind of least privilege, not defaulting to admin, and then just not taking advantage of what the cloud is supposed to be and how it's supposed to work. Uh, let's go with that that last one first. Um, how do you get a company to understand like, hey, this is the cloud. This is not what you did before somewhere else. Like there's a different approach. How can you get people to kind of shift their mindset and where can they go to, to learn about how they should do it? Yeah, I think the first thing you need to do is is figure out uh, one. I, I always tell people like get a lot, get more people involved. Oftentimes, when organizations move to the cloud, they only ask the tech the technologists. They're like, hey, what you know, what do you need to do? And their technologist like, I you know, I just have a three tier application. I'm doing this. They tell you all the I got this OS, this, this, and that. And they're like, that's good information. Yes, I'm not saying that's not good information, but oftentimes you need to figure out what's the goals of the company. Why are you guys moving to the cloud? What are you trying to achieve? Is it performance time? Is it cost optimization? Is it scalability? Because depending on what your goals are, is depending on what services you're using. If your organization is like, we unfortunately have to cut a lot of people, so we need less overhead of managing things. So you should probably look into like a pass. You should probably look into like Elastic Beanstalk or Heroku or something else that allows you just to focus on your code. But maybe it's about performance. So cost isn't that big of a deal. So maybe you should be really looking at how do we make sure that we can scale up really fast? Um, How are we configuring auto scaling groups? What else are we using there in the cloud to make sure that we can support this? How, since we're going to be scaling so fast, and since this is the type of architecture, maybe we should use this different database service, right? Instead of doing it traditionally. So I think the biggest mistake I see is uh, organizations or technologists planning their move to the cloud in a vacuum. Uh, they don't bring anybody else involved. So they don't understand the business justification for the move. And then they get there and the business is like, hey, our, our bill went up and we we're trying to decrease it. And it's because they just deploy things in the same manner. So I think, you know, get the right people involved. And then once you figure out what's the goals, all of these different cloud providers have a ridiculous amount of information about the best ways to right size your environments. And, and what I would also, also suggest is, on AWS, you have support plans. On Azure, they have them as well. Um, most people are going to have like a developer plan, which is like $29 a month. I think the enterprise is like 100 bucks a month or something. Sign up for those support plans, and then you get somebody from AWS or Azure to tell you exactly what to do. <laughs> they, you literally can say, hey, this is my application. Here's the tech stack. Here's what we're trying to achieve. And they're going to say, do this, this, and that. And they know because they're going to want to keep you as a customer and they're going to make sure that it's beneficial for you and like leverage the cloud providers. Oftentimes organizations run to a third party, do all these other things. And I'm like, go to your cloud provider first. Like I'm even, you know, I run a company that's a vendor to so to so. And I'll say like, go to them first and see if they can solve the problem that you're trying to solve with me because those cloud providers built tools specifically for their cloud. So they're going to be all right. Um, They're going to, they're going to do things pretty decently, but I think it's, the biggest thing is it's, it's it, a lot of things in security come back to philosophy and communicating and just getting people on board. And, and similar moving to the cloud, you you have to make sure that you understand the why behind the move and the why behind that that transition so that you can make the right decisions. 
One of the things I saw you bring up in your talk that I think probably dovetails fairly well into this kind of conversation is the AWS well-architected framework and like those kind of conceptual pieces of why you're moving to the cloud and, and the stuff to think about. Can you say a little bit about that framework and, and how people can apply that here? Yeah, the well-architected framework is great. And it's uh, so they the AWS lays it out in a few ways. They have a white paper, they have just a typical static web page, and then there's well-architected labs, which I highly recommend people that are getting familiar with AWS to, to do. And there's a bunch of different pillars, security, performance, reliability. I'm going to butcher one of these. Um, there's five. A cost is one, and then there's another one. Uh, but you can literally go in and AWS says, here's the right way to configure your environment according to performance metrics, according to security metrics. And it's not a compliance framework. It's not something to say, go out and check the box and say, I am doing these things X, Y, and Z. It's more of a way to say, how am I making my decisions? Am I making my decisions according to what AWS is saying that I should do? And the really, the thing that I love about it are the labs, because they'll say, hey, you should protect your, um, your compute infrastructure. And then you can go do a lab and see, how do I leverage AWS services to do that? How do I, and, and not necessarily that you have to do that, but you can see the concepts. You can see, okay, um, they're telling me to uh, do a vulnerability scan and then automate the patching right behind it. Maybe I can do that with something else that I'm using in my environment, but that's a way that you can do things. They're teaching me how to do auto scaling, whatever it may be, right? Um, so the well-architected framework is something that if you're just learning about AWS, you should read because it's literally telling you, here's how to do things right on the cloud. And it's going to help you understand what are some of those key services, what are those, some of those key risks that you should be protecting yourself against. Awesome. Awesome. Um, that second piece that we had mentioned previously, the visibility portion of the cloud, right? Let's say you kind of get this all deployed and you have the right mindset and you know what you're, what you're kind of doing there, but now you have to watch it, right? And make sure that things are indeed happening as you expect them to happen. Uh, what are some of the tools and, and kind of techniques for doing that piece of this? Yeah, on AWS, I would say you, uh, there's enough information out there that you can uh, detect things that you know are bad. And I would say you should make that response right next to it. Uh, detection and response should be tied in together. But on it, on AWS specifically and on other services, I know Azure has done some great things with a service called Azure Sentinel, which gives you that visibility. And the thing I like about Azure that I've found from a security perspective is you can do more with less on Azure. AWS, you're going to have to string together a few services to get some stuff done. But on Azure, you can actually like remediate things from Sentinel or remediate things from Azure Security Center, which is pretty cool. Um, but on AWS, what I would say is, number one is you have to have CloudTrail enabled. Um, and CloudTrail is enabled. CloudTrail is just a login service on AWS, logs all API activity, whether you're in the console, the API, machine to machine, doesn't really matter. Um, it's going to log everything. But it's on by default. Um, this is something that most people mess up on. It's on by default. You're going to get 90 days of event history. But anybody that's in security knows 90 days is not enough, especially because attacks happen and you don't find out six months till down the line. So what you're supposed to do is create a trail um, which stores those logs persistent in an S3 bucket and allows you to put some retention and stuff on there. But there's another a bunch of other services that you should be using, like AWS Config, AWS Security Hub. And those AWS Config is going to go out and get uh, resources and, and inventory of your entire environment. But what it also can do is they have a set of rules that you can say, hey, like I only want my S3 buckets to be private. I don't want any S3 buckets to be public. That AWS config will go out, check to see if there's any buckets that are uh, public, and it'll alert you. It'll tell you, hey, here's what's going on, um, which is critical, right? You, you can't just log things and not know when things are bad. You need to have some alerting and do some tuning in there to make sure that you know when a trigger point happens. When something happens, I need to react to it. Cool thing about config <clears throat> that is... Uh, in this, I'll tell you a little, like an improvement story on AWS, which is always great because it used to be with AWS Config, you would have to go get um, use Lambda, write you a function to go out and remediate an S3 bucket. That was the only way to do it, um, which was it wasn't you know it wasn't terrible, it wasn't bad, but you still had to string some stuff together. And Lambda functions can get weird sometimes. Um, so AWS Config now you can literally set auto remediation in Config. So you can say I want all of my S3 buckets to be private. If you find one that's public, automatically remediate it and send me a message when you do. So you can set detection, you can set response and notification, and then, you know, go to the beach or hang out and do whatever you want without having to, like, stare at your computer all day. And that's the power of the cloud. So when you talk about detection and visibility, I think if you're in the sock space, the blue team space, 
you have to go beyond just detecting in the cloud because things move so fast. You don't want to get a notification that an S3 bucket was public because these bad actors are scanning constantly. Like I, I, I read something the other day. It was like it took four seconds for a access key to be compromised and that was deployed to GitHub. And this, these uh, these uh, security researchers did like this this research and they just kept and literally four seconds before it was found um, because they're just constantly searching repos, constantly searching S3 buckets for weaknesses. So you don't want to just get you don't want to get detected. You don't want to get notified. You want to actually fix it before somebody steps in and does something bad. Um, so I would say, you know, as you're thinking about visibility, think about remediation in the cloud specifically, because it's a lot easier to detect and remediate pretty quickly in the cloud. Yeah, that's a. Uh... Scary, right? Four seconds to compromise. That's insane. Clearly an important piece there. The third piece that you had mentioned, the default um, defaulting to admin being the error, right? And and what we want, which is more of let's only give people the exact permission they need. What are some of the tools and things that we can use to ensure that is happening? And if someone makes a mistake, uh, detect it right away at the speed of, you know, four seconds and, and maybe autom- automatic uh, mediation of that. Is that possible? <laughs> It is. Yeah, you can get pretty granular with policies and prevent people from from making bad policies. When it comes to identity on the cloud, there's some 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 basics that you should do. Uh, you should not have all of your cloud users in the same account or environment as your actual resources. Um, so if you have 20 users, you should have a separate AWS account for those users and they should only have access to that. And then to get to other accounts, you should be using IAM roles. Uh, to do that for them to role switch. So if uh, anybody hearing this is probably immediately thinking AWS organizations, the answer is yes. You should be using AWS organizations to manage this. But then with that, you can apply a few things. You can apply service control policies to each of your accounts. When service control policies are just um, IAM policies that say what users can cannot can can access in an account. So it doesn't actually give anyone permissions. It just applies guardrails. But you can apply a guardrail and say, in this account, no one can add an IAM um, policy that says these things. Um, you can't even put a policy that allows an, a wildcard um, in there to get people unfiltered access. So you can make it to where even if your team, you lay out the policy, you guys have this meeting and you go through security awareness training and all this stuff. And then Joe goes out and says, I'm going to do it anyways. He'll stop them. Won't even let them do it. And you don't have to think about it. Um, the other thing you can do is leverage a lot of these tools out there. Again, native tools. On AWS, there's a tool called IAM Access Analyzer, which does least privilege checks. Every single account, and a lot of people don't know this, you go to a user account, and you can do this in the CLI as well. But if you do if you do it in the console, you go to a user's profile, there's a tab that says Access Advisor. It'll tell you the services that they access. It'll tell you when they access them. So you can see like, hey, this person has admin access to RDS, and they've literally never accessed it. They probably don't need that access, so they probably don't um, need that. Um, so it's, it's, I think it's a constant review of your policies. And then going out and saying, all right, I know John, where he works. Most of the time he spends his day in EC2. He spends his time in Athena, and he spends his time on S3 buckets going through our logs, right? There's no reason for you to have uh, access to Elastic Beanstalk um, or something else that we're using out there, right? So I'm going to remove that from your permissions, and I can do that by looking at Access Advisor, looking at IAM Access Analyzer, applying those service control policies. And what I always tell people, especially on the blue team side, automate your way out of a job um, because there's more work to be done. You're not going to get fired. <laughs> You're going to keep your job. But if you have to, if you constantly are checking policies, IAM policies, and you're constantly evaluating your your people and saying like, man, all these people don't need this access and it's too much. Go ahead and apply a service control policy that stops people from doing that because your company is only going to keep hiring. They're only going to get bigger. So your problems are just going to expand if you don't automate it in the early days. So whenever you're like, I'd say leverage internal technologies. I hope AWS comes out with what Azure came out with, with the just-in-time access, because that's pretty cool. You can really limit things there and, and require people to request. You can have some approval workflows and stuff, which that's like the, I think the goal of least privilege is where I have to request it immediately when at the time I need access and not get any kind of consistent or persistent access to things. But obviously that takes some time. <laughs> yeah, that actually um, leads perfectly into the next question I was going to ask. Uh, one, I love all of that because that's the mindset of like, let's set the least privilege, what we think it should be from the beginning, and then actually go back and, and audit to make sure like, are people even using the things we thought they needed? And we can still take that stuff out. The question that was leading to in my head is, you know, 
someone has to be an admin, right? And so when that person who is an admin and is supposed to have that access and does use it gets compromised, how do we stop those credentials from being used? And how can we detect that sort of thing? Yeah, that's a great question. And this goes back to um, segmenting your users. So when you put your users in its own account, if I'm a bad actor and I compromise your account, John, and you're an admin, I log into that account, right? Um, now I'm looking around and I'm like, all right, let me go check EC2. Let me, I can't, and there's no resources there. There's literally none. And then you can also apply a service control policy on that account that says the only service that users can access in that account is IAM. That's it. Um, you can't access anything else. You can't even, if you go to EC2, you're going to get API errors. If you go to S3, you're going to get API errors. And there's nothing in that account anyways. So you have to always think about um, anybody in security knows it's not a matter of if you're going to be hacked, it's a matter of when. So when you do get hacked, how do you limit the blast radius? How do you make sure that the problem that, that happened there isn't something that is going to have a detrimental impact on the company? And the other thing there is, you know, leverage, again, leverage technology to see, is there anything weird going on? If John normally comes from a certain IP, um, and now he's coming from Africa, uh, maybe we should take a look at that. Maybe that's not right. Um, and that's where guard duty can help. That's where even something as simple, if you don't want to use some of those things, just VPC flow logs. Like you can just look in and see that and you can have some alerting and automation of those logs with, with um, other services. And you have to start to understand what are the normal behaviors of your users? Um, because uh, anomalous behaviors will oftentimes indicate not necessarily a compromise, but a potential compromise. Um, if I see that uh, John normally is logging in at certain times or he's coming from a certain IP address or a certain type of OS or whatever it may be. And all of those things shift. It's probably a sign that, hey, you know, something might be off here. So I would say, you know, biggest thing is limit the blast radius. Put MFA everywhere. MFA is not infallible. Um, there, there's ways to crack it. And I think we've seen that in the past. But it does make it a little bit diff a little more difficult. Um, and you can add some conditional statements to every single IAM role in AWS that says if a user didn't log in originally with MFA, they can't even use the role. They can't even role switch. Um, and then you can also apply a force MFA policy. So if you're, again, you're thinking about I'm a tier one support person and I every time someone joins, I have to make sure that they have MFA enabled on their user account, right? Instead of doing that individual check every single time, you can apply an IAM policy that says unless a user logs in with MFA, the only thing they can do is enable MFA. doesn't matter if they're an admin doesn't matter if they have unfiltered access. If they didn't log in with MFA, the only they're going to click around the console. They're going to try to do stuff in the CLI. They're going to get access denied until they enable MFA, log out, and then um, log back in with MFA. So there's a lot of ways that you can say, you know what? Like I know it's harder to compromise an identity uh, IAM user account if MFA is enabled. So I'm going to make sure that that happens every time, no matter what, especially in a small organization. You know, you join a new organization, you're super excited to get started. You're just going to hop in and start working and you forget to enable MFA. Next thing you know, the new guy's account's compromised um, because no one checked on that. And it's hard to manually do that. So a lot of times you just got to automate those things and, and just make it a little bit harder for those bad actors to do things. Yeah, that's that's a, a super important tip right there, the MFA and like locking it to, to making important changes. One of the things and principles with a lot of this, you know, cloud technology and, and where we're going really with the whole industry is, is zero trust, right? And, and one of the kind of core bedrock principles of zero trust is like verify everything all the time. And so when we're looking at the authentication piece, it's like, how do we know John is John? And how do we know John is coming in from his own machine? Uh, are there opportunities with AWS or really any cloud platform? Like, how would you recommend companies lock both of those things to actually making those important changes? Is there like a specific tool or other thing you'd like for that? Yeah, I've seen some really cool third party tools um, that do some great things from an identity perspective. And it, it's more of like just in time access uh, and, and, and it does some validations and you can get I've seen some companies do some really cool things where they, you know, it, it even down to the machine and they're still installing certificates on machines. You know, really simple ways are just using a VPN um, required in, in order to get to any. And, and a lot of people don't realize this because they think, you know, a, the AWS console is a web based browser. So they don't think you can apply like IP restrictions to it, but you can. Um, you can say in the IAM policy, you can add a conditional statement that says unless this person comes from this IP, don't let them log in. Um, so you can. You can even, you know, establish some kind of corporate structure where you say, I only want people that come from this place, this IP to get to my AWS account. And that that help. That's helpful. Um, but, you know, there's also still still risk there and, and, and ways people can get around that. 
Um, but I would say it's being as a, a, the reason why I'm so big on automating is because it allows security professionals to do some critical thinking, to do some of this analysis that's required because the, it's hard to really come up with a solution without knowing your users, without knowing what's normal. So hopefully if you're listening to this and you're like, all right, I'm going to go out and automate some things, you take that time that you got back to be able to go back and, you know, just check out what are your, when do your users work? When does everybody work? And then set some triggers for when you see activity outside of those hours. And I'm not saying to block everything, but it starts to allow you to see what does normal look like. And normal can obviously change in this remote environment, but it's very easy to paint a picture of what things should be doing. Where should people be coming from? How can I see that? How can I see when something changes for those particular users? And then I set some notifications around that. But I think a lot of times people think of automation as it's going to cost me my job, but I think it allows you to do what you were hired to do, which is critically think and actually understand what's going on and perform some of this analysis that we're talking about to be able to say, all right, I have these users and I want to make sure that they are coming from the right places. They are the right people and they're doing things that they're supposed to do. That requires time. That requires you to dive deep into the logs, dive deep into your tooling and figure out what's the best way to do this and what's the best way to do this in a way that's not going to disrupt my teams. Because if you disrupt your teams, they're going to find ways around you. Um, So you also have to work with them too. And that's a whole other aspect of it. But I would say, you know, automate some of the easy stuff like MFA, S3 bucket security, some of the basics. And then that allows you to get some more time to do that analysis and research to make better decisions. Yeah, that's that's such an important point. You know, the automation thing is such a benefit in all factors, right? Like no one likes doing the basic work. No one likes feeling like a robot. And uh, it shifts the work away from, you know, that terrible stuff towards the fun, engaging, unique challenges that people get to do every day. And so, yeah, it's, it's definitely something um, I love seeing there. In terms of things that you have seen when this is not done right, could you give us some picture of what are the most common errors you see in, in setup and, and uh, that kind of thing? Yeah, I would say um, the most common, and, and it's unfortunate, is like people don't patch still. <laughs> like, like people just for some reason have no, like, and it's not just patching because I think patching is, uh, sometimes just thought of as like patch Tuesday where you just like hit a button and things get patched, but it's how do you find out about vulnerabilities and then what do you do with that information? And then how do you go about remediating it? And then what do you do after you remediate it to check again, to see that you actually remediate it and what's that kind of reoccurring workflow look like. And that's the biggest, there's, that's one of the biggest, there's another one that I'll talk about in a second, but that's one of the biggest gaps I see is there's not a lot of uh, process or thought that goes into, I have a machine I need to constantly assess it for vulnerabilities. I need to then be able to fix those. And then I need to be able to assess it again to see that they were actually fixed and do that regularly. I mean, there's a whole thing, uh, you know, zero, zero days exist. Uh, so that means there's going to be a chance that something's going to happen that no one knows about. But then they're gonna, everybody's going to find out and you're going to have to act rapidly. So why not already have a system in place to address some of these things? So I think that's a big, humongous uh, gap that I see that, it's been surprising to me just being in the industry as long as I have to still see it as issues, especially with the cloud providers where you can automate a lot of this stuff. Um, on, an, on AWS, you can use Amazon Inspector and Systems Manager, run a regular vulnerability scan and patch those instances automatically after that scan and run a rescan. You can do it all without thinking about it and it takes maybe like 10 minutes to set up, so which is crazy to think about because so many people don't do it. The other is change management and SDLC and the CICD process. And I think there's a shift happening right now in that because we're getting security more involved. DevSecOps is coming up. So I keep hearing more people talk about SaaS tools that they're using. They're doing more security tests during the build process. But there's still the wild, wild west in change management. People are still just deploying changes wildly, no permissions in GitHub. It's just, you know, I, I, you know sometimes I see organizations where they're allowing users to have their personal GitHub accounts to deploy and do things at the company GitHub master branch. And it is in, and I'm just like, Hey, that's not good. (laughs) We should, we should fix that. Uh, That's not good at all. So like change management is a, I enjoy those conversations because we get to have fun and talk a lot about tools and things like that. But it is a big gap. That's still a huge gap. I don't think auditors have figured out the way to actually assess change management, especially like a full CICD pipeline. Um, And I think, it's, it's going to get better because of DevSecOps, but 
there is this battle right now between the development space and where does security fit in there. And um, oftentimes it's just about they think that security is going to slow them down. But technology has improved so much. I don't think that's the case anymore. You can do a lot of good security tests early on in the process, even at the local level in your IDE, you can do security tests that will prevent bad things from happening. So I think, you know, patching and change management are two of the biggest weaknesses I see. And oftentimes where most of the issues pop up. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. We did an episode earlier this season on uh, DevSecOps and got a lot of good uh, feedback on that. So clearly people are getting more and more interested in, in that sort of a thing. So excited to see that. Maybe a tough question. If you, and I don't know where your expertise lies on all of the cloud platforms, clearly, you know, AWS pretty well and, and some Azure stuff. Uh, I don't know beyond that. Um, but if you were to pick a platform right now to, and, and you wanted to create, you know, the most secure, easy to manage kind of setup, is there one platform you think that maybe sticks out in terms of completeness of vision and ease of implementation of getting it right and all that kind of stuff? Yeah, I would say uh, Azure, and, and it's crazy because two months ago I would have said AWS, hands down. But Azure has improved dramatically, and you can do a lot more with less on Azure. Uh, you don't have to put together as many tools um, on, on Azure as you do on AWS. I will say that you could build a pretty big wall on AWS uh, You could without a lot of customization. That's the thing with Azure where... There's a lot of the stuff out of the box you're gonna have to con- you're gonna have to configure a little bit. Like Sentinel is very noisy when you first start using it. It's ridiculous. It's not useful at all. So you have to do a lot of tuning. Whereas on AWS, their out of the box stuff isn't gonna be as noisy. Um, it's gonna help you. Like for example, you can use their WAF. It comes with the t- OAuth top ten um, that it's blocking. It has some really cool stuff um, from like some AWS perspective. And now. Even if you are writing the worst application ever and it's the most vulnerable set of <laughs> code that's ever been out there, you have at least a WAF in front of it um, that um, has now, when you put the WAF, you have AWS's DDoS team, their shield, you get that with the WAF, the basic version, but now you have DDoS protection from Amazon. Um, and uh, they, they, I think they stopped like a two or three terabyte DDoS attack like last uh, year or two years ago. It was like the largest ever in the history of, of those attacks. So like you have a pretty good team there helping you out. Um, so on AWS, you could build a really nice wall around your environment. Uh, I would say with all three cloud providers, the thing that I am so excited to see is that there is no reason for any cloud provider for you to publicly expose your, your compute instances. There's literally no reason for it anymore. In the past, you know, we'd be like, oh, well, I need an SSH there. And I'm like, all right, well, make it come from a VPN. They're like, oh, well, my users are everywhere. So they, you always have excuses. Now you can use cloud-based shells or other tools like Session Manager to do management functions on these machines, whether it's RDP, whether it's SSH, doesn't matter. And that in itself right there is going to help improve the security industry because now we don't have public instances anymore that people can just hit all day and do bad things to and port scan and all this other stuff too, right? So I, you know, I would say Azure, it hurts me to say this, but you could do a lot more on with them from a security perspective with less on Azure. But you can't go wrong on AWS. I don't know much about GCP. I know a little bit, but not as much. But AWS has a lot of security services. Security Hub has is, is become so great. Um, if you're on AWS, you should be using Security Hub 100%. Um, if it's not turned on, you're wrong. <laughs> you should definitely turn it on. So, you know, you can't go wrong with either AWS or Azure. Very cool. Yeah, it's interesting to see your answer would have changed, you know, at just a short while ago. And that kind of speaks to the pace of change of the cloud, right? Final question. What are going to be the challenges of the future? Clearly, these cloud platforms are trying to help us get it right. Do you think we're going to continue to have the same problems or are are you seeing a shift towards solving those and and new issues? And if so, what are those new issues? Yeah, I think the cloud providers are doing a better job of of helping people make good decisions in the cloud. I think in the past, it was, you know, it was really easy to do bad things in the cloud. Um, But now the cloud providers are, excuse me, making it a little bit more difficult. I think the problem that we're going to see is that, uh, and we saw it earlier this year, uh, bad actors are now taking advantage of the cloud. Um, So they can't remember which, I think it was a SolarWinds attack that they said the bad actors were using, they were on AWS. Like they literally were using machines on AWS to do the attack. So I think with the rise in cloud computing, you have to understand that it's not just the good people using the cloud. So the compute power that you have, the ability that you have to scale, the bad actors do too. Um, and they can use that to their advantage. So I think the biggest challenges is going to be time to response uh, moving forward. We're going to be able to detect things because of everything the cloud providers are doing for us and because of the knowledge about what's going on. But how fast do you remediate? 
because the bad actors are going to get faster and faster and they're going to be able to breach you and do something bad in a matter of seconds at, at some points because of the they're, they're leveraging the same technology you're leveraging, which is crazy. You know, you could be hosted on AWS and a bad actor can hack you from AWS too, probably in the same region. But that's the, the power and the cool part of the cloud. So I think uh, SOC analysts, SOC teams are going to the metrics about how fast you respond from something bad are going to become more and more important as we grow. And that's what people are going to be evaluated on um, more so than just uh, I close out X number of tickets. It's like, cool. But when, when did you find out? And then, and then what happened? And then how can we make that time better? Because I think it's just going to become harder and harder to prevent things. So now you have to say, OK, I know something bad is going to happen, but I fixed it right away and got, you know, quarantine that machine or whatever it may be that you have to do. So I think incident response at, a, at its core is going to become such a huge part over the next 10 years. Yeah. Um, you know, speaking at the, at the pace of, you know, breaches, and you mentioned the four second thing before, that's one thing I'm always kind of mentioning during class is like, you need to move at the same speed or better than your attacker. So if they're finding your key in four seconds, you better respond in four seconds or less, right? So getting that process right, absolutely crucial. Um, you mentioned a bunch of awesome things along the way here. Uh, so hopefully people have a whole bunch of inspiration out of this episode. Where can we find you and your information and, and contact you online if we want to learn more? Yeah, so I'm on uh, I'm on Twitter now. Uh, recently, uh, got on Twitter. Uh, so you can find me at AJ Yon on Twitter, um, on LinkedIn as well. I'm uh, I, I talk a lot on LinkedIn, and uh, you know a lot of uh, I'm talking crap a lot of times. <laughs> so, uh, but um, LinkedIn and Twitter are the way to find me. I've started doing these weekly LinkedIn live sessions where I just answer questions from the community and um, talk to them, and, and definitely. The reason I got on Twitter was Steven. He made me um, from Sands. He, he forced me to get on Twitter. Uh, so uh, I, I've enjoyed Twitter. Twitter's fun, even though it's a wild place sometimes. Um, people say some crazy things on there. But Twitter or, or LinkedIn, you know, I try to be reachable. I try to be accessible. Um, I, I like to get back and talk with people. So if you're listening to this and um, you think I can add value, definitely reach out and we'll find some time to connect and, and chat. My time is becoming increasingly limited, but I still find time to give back and, and mentor as much as I can. So Twitter or LinkedIn is probably the best place to find me. Thank you very much. Uh, tons of awesome information here. A lot of good tools. We'll make sure all this stuff gets into the show notes and all of that. With that, I think we're finished up. So thank you very much for giving us your time here to be on the Blueprint Podcast. Really appreciate it. Hey, Blue Teamers. I hope you enjoyed today's episode of Blueprint. If you've got a second and want to help support the podcast, please subscribe and leave us a review on Apple Podcasts. It would be really, really meaningful to us. And if you have any ideas or suggestions, I would love to hear them. Your reviews are going to be one of the best ways to help others find this podcast. So anything you could do would be a big help. As always, thank you for listening. You can connect to me on social at SecHub, S-E-C-H-U-B-B on Twitter or on LinkedIn. So until next time, thank you for listening to the Blueprint Podcast.